And he knew right away in that his area. He, he saw that it work and he checked on it and then he phoned me because I don't want it. And he said, Andrew, he said, I'm not trying to, but maybe before we start spending a whole lot of money, you might want to take a look at this because I don't know. It's just, it's not, it's not a good, uh, it's not a good testimony on the, uh, yeah, you're right, we don't, we don't need any more, we got enough problems in that, and we, yeah, okay, I'll flip that to you, though. That's, that's a good thing. Good night. Bring this meeting to order, please. Uh, public information notice as required under bylaw 144 2007. The public is advised of council's intention to adopt the following meeting as June 21st, 2022 meeting. This is June 21st. June 7th. Authorized budget amendments as a result of recent funding announcements that were not previously built into the 22, 2022 capital plan. $500,000 to be funded through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation for the City of Kenar Parks repairs and improvement projects. $450,000 to be funded through the NOHFC for the Norman Park Playground interpretive area upgrade and improvement projects. $500,000 to be funded through NOHFC for the City of Kenora Baseball Diamond Enhancement Project. $500,000 to be funded through the NHO, NA, NOHFC for the City of Kenora Kiwait Memorial Arena Repair and Upgrade Project. $480,000 to be funded through the NOHFC for the City of Kenora Dock Upgrade Project. $400,000 to be funded through the NOHFC for the Museum Retrofit Project. $3,666,499.56 to be funded through Invest in Canada Infrastructure Program through its Community Culture and Recreation Stream Program for the Kenora Recreation Centre Rehabilitation Project. Acquire 38 properties for municipal purposes from the Province of Ontario described in FCP 2200-041. List of forfeited corporate properties and property descriptions in the amount of $3,000,000. million Two hundred and seventy-six thousand dollars plus HSD. Could we have the blessing and land acknowledgement, Councillor Chase? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. As we gather, we recognize we are on Treaty Three lands, which are steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations and Métis people today. We continue to be thankful for our partnerships with Indigenous people. We give thanks for the many blessings that we enjoy in the City of Kenora. We seek wisdom in our mind, clearness in our thinking truth in our speaking and always love in our hearts so that we may try always to unite the citizens of Kenora. Let these principles guide us in our decision making. Thank you, Councillor Chase. I'll make a call for a, a blessing or a, pardon me, a declaration of pecuniary interest and in the general nature thereof on today's agenda or from a meeting in which a member was not in attendance. And none declared. i a call for a confirmation of previous committee minutes the regular committee of the whole meeting, May 10th, 2022. Your Worship, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Poirier, that the minutes from the last regular committee of the whole meeting held May 10th, 2022, be confirmed as written and filed. Thank you. And carried. Uh, now we'll move to presentations. I would ask that anyone turn off their cell phones. Or, uh, we have no uh, interruptions. Uh, the deputations will be allowed for 15 minutes at maximum. And uh, I would ask that anybody in the gallery respect that uh, the only speakers are council and the, the deputation presenter. First up, Dr. Joel Croker, divestment of city interest in Kuwait Medical Clinic. Great. Okay. okay, thank you. So, yeah, I'm Dr. Craker. Uh, I have, I'll just introduce the, the other doctors here. It's Dr. Wayner, Dr. Olson, Dr. Weeb, and we have Dr. Lowen here today as well. Um, Mayor and Council, thanks for providing us with the opportunity to speak to you this morning regarding the city's interest in di divesting the ownership of the Q8 Medical Clinic. Uh, as detailed in the publicized call for expressions of interest in the acquisition of the property. Uh, 
We were quite surprised to learn about uh, the posting. Uh, we were informed of it by a concerned patient at our clinic. Our hope today is that by highlighting the history of the clinic and giving some information on the service delivery to the community, we can convince you that this clinic is an asset for the city to own rather than a liability to dispose of. Uh, the construction of the Kuwait Medical Clinic was a culmination of a community effort by the residents of Kuwaitan who recognized the need for sustainable medical services. Uh, they fundraised 50% of the cost of the project and that was then matched with funding by the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation or NOHFC to complete the financing. Construction was finished in 1985. At that time, the corporation of the town of Kuwaitan acquired the property and signed an agreement with the founding physician, Dr. Lowen, to lease the property as well as to repay to the town the amount that was fundraised by the citizens. Uh, this repayment of the fundraising contribution was completed around 1992. The building continued to be leased to the physicians who provided services <coughs> from the location. Uh, the intent of the lease payments was to address eventual expenses related to building maintenance costs, which would be expected to arise during the life of the building. Currently, the uh, physicians who work in the clinic pay a fair market lease rate based on the location. Numerous leasehold improvements have been completed and financed by the service providers in the clinic. So our, our clinic is unique in Kenora in several ways. And I just wanted to take a couple minutes to highlight that. Uh, we're proud to have established a model there that's service oriented and sustainable. We serve approximately 2,500 citizens of Kenora and Kiwaitan. Uh, we're the only clinic in which the physicians offer truly cradle to grave service uh, from managing deliveries and obstetrics, including C-sections, care throughout the life, including serving our patients in hospital and we're actually the only practice in Kenora to do this uh, and care at the end of life including in long-term care facilities and palliative care. So our physicians embody a diverse skill set unique to rural specialists and provide really a spectrum of services to the community not just limited to patients of our clinic. So that includes cancer chemotherapy, uh, minor surgery, care in the emergency department, Hospitalist care, so this is if you're admitted to hospital and you're a patient of a practice that's not a Kuwaitan clinic, then the hospitalist service takes care of you and we participate in that. Advanced diagnostic test interpretation and obstetrical care to patients of other practices as well. So our doctors from this small clinic in this small town uh, actually have been recognized with numerous awards for excellence in care, including Ontario Regional Family Physician of the Year, Dr. Weiner and this year's Ontario Rural Emergency Room Physician of the Year, Dr. Weeb. Our clinic is the only clinic with advanced access on-demand booking, which means that a patient can be seen within a couple of days um, for any reason. And we were actually the only clinic to deliver an on-site COVID vaccination program to our patients. Further, our clinic has historically been the most effective training and recruitment site for physicians in Kenora. We've been associated with NOSM as a teaching site since their inception and with other universities prior to that. Of the 15 physicians in Kenora who currently have family practices, eight were trained in the Kuwaitan Medical Clinic. We're from Kenora and we have committed to serve Kenora. Two of us were born and raised in Kenora and the other two have made this our home. We've raised families here. We've lived here for more than 20 years. Our clinic has been a model of stability with no unexpected turnover of providers in the past 20 years. But uh, our stability is not guaranteed and we feel it's now at risk. Even the possibility of sale of our building has been destabilizing as it has created uncertainty for our patients, staff and providers. Privatization of the clinic building will create further pressure on our operation by increasing the cost to provide services and by creating a perpetual risk of loss of purpose of the building. Privatization will not lead to sustainability in the delivery of medical services to the citizens. So we feel that the city has given the citizens and service providers 
a bit of a mixed message. On the one hand, we know the city has developed some policies to attempt to attract providers, including providing funding for recruitment and retention of health professionals, but is also sending the message that the Kuwait Medical Clinic is not of value to the city and has even invited consideration of other uses of the building in the expression of interest. To us, if the vision of a new landlord doesn't align with the goals of service delivery to the patients, then we couldn't provide any guarantee we'd be, that we'd be able to continue our operation there. This building was built with the sole purpose of providing care to the citizens as a project initiated by the people. And we believe there's at least an ethical and moral obligation on the part of the city to act as a steward in this to ensure that the patients of the clinic can be confident they'll be able to access medical care there as they have since the day that it opened. We would like to work with the city to provide a better solution to sustainability than privatization. And we have a number of alternatives that could qualify. Our, our first choice, and probably the easiest for everybody, would be to maintain the status quo. We've been happy to have the city as our landlord. The city could retain ownership of the asset and they'd be seen as a progressive and modern community that values medical care. We'd continue to lease the building and provide services there. The second option would be to follow a process analogous to what was done with the other clinic in Kenora, which is transfer the ownership of the building to an existing or a new nonprofit corporation to take over stewardship of the asset. Uh, we know that a year ago, the city offered to transfer ownership of this building for a dollar to the KHCC, which is the organization that's responsible for the uh, Patterson Clinic, um, and they declined to accept it. But that does at least demonstrate the city was favorable to that model as a possibility. Uh, after the committee declined to accept the building, we requested last year that it be transferred to us, but we did not receive a response from the city. So we who represent more than a quarter of the physicians with family practices in all of Kenora are willing to work with you on this and we hope we've convinced you that the Kuwait Medical Clinic through its unique and consistent model of service delivery is actually a jewel in Kenora's crown that you can be proud to maintain ownership of. But no matter the outcome, the four of us wanted to be able to look our patients in the eye and tell them we stood up for them today and whatever the city's decision is, it was made with all the relevant information available. Thank you. Dr. Craker, I, I just have a quick question. Yeah. So I'm not aware of the clinic um, making an appeal to the city. So I've never seen that and I don't believe anybody on our team is aware of that. And in fact, we've had conversations with members of your clinic and uh, that option was rejected. So I'd love to see uh, the offer that, that you feel the clinic made to the city because that has not been forthcoming. Can I have Dr. Wainer speak sure. to that? I think he was. Sure. Of course. Uh, your trial, I believe we yes, spoke on the phone. Yes, sir. Uh, you and two other staff members. Stace and Adam and I, we had a conversation. with me and asked me to uh, fill you in on the background of the clinic yes, sir. so that you could talk to counsel in an attempt to uh, move through this process. In that letter that was provided last July, it indicates that we would be willing to accept the building, but our preference is that the city of Kumar continue to be the landlord. Uh, we have the letter that I sent to you. I, I've read that letter. That's I. That's not consistent with my reading of the letter. I'll I'll take another look at it. So okay. thank you for answering that. I can answer any questions. Questions or comments, Council. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Dr. Coker. Um, I've um, been a long-time resident of Q8 and on um, City Council for a while. I know how hard we try to recruit and retain doctors in our community um, and um, what that facility brings to our community and the physicians that have been there. And um, you, you just mentioned one thing that I wanted to follow up on. You said that um, you... Uh, Yourself, the doctors have invested some funds in maintaining that building. Um, so I just wanted to have a bit of a conversation sure. with you about that because I understand since amalgamation we've collected lease payments from you, and I think amalgamation is 20 years in the past. Yeah. And um, we have invested money. The city has invested um, capital funds in that building. And I've asked for an accounting from our um, CAO about 
um, the revenue collected, mm -hmm. the capital costs expended, because I think that's really important information going forward. But it was interesting for me to hear that you've invested some of your own money in yeah. building maintenance. Yeah, we've, we've uh, invested some of our own money. We've also uh, pursued and obtained grants in order to improve and, and provide more space, for example, f to allow the uh, family health team to expand their operation and support our clinic. So we've renovated, we've done renovations to the clinic to give space to those providers as well. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. I, I do understand how important that clinic is to, yeah. to Q8 and, and the whole community for sure. Right. Well, I thank appreciate you. that. Thank you. Thanks. Councilor McMillan. Dr. Coker, I appreciate the uh, presentation and I'm, I'm happy to see that the uh, door stays open so we can look at some options okay. and respect to your presentation and, right. and the quality of care. So thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Anything further? No. Thank you for your presentation. We'll take yeah. this under consideration. Thank you. Uh, next up, we'd like to hear from Susan Cohen, uh, North, of Park, North of Bypass Property Owners. Good morning. Thank you for allowing us to present today our concerns. Uh, my name is Susan Cohn, and with me today is Richard Cohn, Rob Perry, and Kathy Billick, some residents up north of the bypass. I'm a full-time resident on Williams Road on the east side of East Malik on Black Sturgeon Lakes. I'm representing approximately 800 property owners who live in the city of Kenora that are, is, that are in north of the bypass area. This includes Black Sturgeon Lakes, Grassy Lake, Austin Lake, Schnarr Lake, Coker Road, East Mellick, Essex, west side of Black Sturgeon, including the Black Sturgeon Property Owners Association, and properties not on lakefront. This number includes private property owners and businesses. The residents of the area of north of the bypass are bringing forth complaints today, which include lack of representation on council, poor road conditions, an inability to secure timely repairs, accurate information, and access to information. The three complaints are interrelated and I'll explain our issues. Concerning lack of representation, prior to May 13 evacuation order, the water had risen over marsh crossings on East Malik by Essex, Coker by Kelly, East Malik by Bells Point, as it does frequently in the spring. Granted, this year was higher, but not higher than the 97 high watermark levels, not higher than the 100 year watermark level, which is a city specification for road building. Uh, it's used by the city roads and the engineering department to set specs for roads going through marshes. Uh, is it possible to show the Williams Road extension picture, please? This is an extension built on Williams Road by um, Naniska and Sons and Black Fox Construction. You can see there's no water over it. This was at the high, highest water mark in Black Sturgeon's Lakes this spring. It was built in 2008 to the city of Kenora's specifications. It was built to the 100 year high water mark, which was measured in several places around the city, the dam being one of those places. It has four very large culverts, at least 30 to 36 inches in diameter, as well as at least four smaller culverts. A very well-built road with expertise and a well-inspected road by the city engineering department at that time. Complaints about the poor maintenance of the road areas I have mentioned above have been made most years. This year, the roads department could have lifted the roads and made them safe to travel without creating an evacuation order. A local road builder stated they called the city and gave an estimate and stated they could get people back in their homes immediately. The report, they report that they spoke with an engineer at the city at least three times over the month and never heard back on their bids or their offers to repair the roads and lift them enough for passage. As the evacuation order continued, people were forced to walk through the flooded area in hip waders, parking their car at either end of the access so they could go to work, get their children to school, go to medical appointments, 
get groceries, or they had to risk crossing in their own vehicles. The city announced it wasn't safe to travel, but hydro trucks went through, building supply deliveries went through, and people had nowhere to go as the evacuation order did not have an appropriate evacuation plan. We were all forced to continue traveling through, safe or not. The roads could have been made safe much earlier than they were, should have been without the residents north of the bypass needing to phone, complain, beg, harass their council, harass their mayor, harass their roads department and operations. When a resident near the Coker Kelly flooded marsh phoned last week and asked when the marsh area was to be lifted to match the lifting of the other areas, he was told to drive around. He lives close to Kelly, separated from Reddit by the flooded area, adding miles at extra expense. Um, this is not an appropriate answer, especially ignoring the concerns for emergency services, OPP, or fire. Uh, it would be over 40 minutes for the fire truck to get there going around. Again, this, there was a relatively quick and easy fix quoted by a local roads builder and refused by the city for unknown reasons. We state the evacuation order was never needed, earlier repairs and solutions were available, and we should have been serviced in a timely way. We feel if we had a council member who was in tune with our concerns, perhaps the decision to stop road repairs and substitute an evacuation order with the threat of no emergency coverage if you choose to shelter at home would not have been made so hastily. A response from the CAO to one of our residents indicated that he thought people were just anxious to get to their recreational properties, clearly ignoring the needs of the hundreds of people who call north of the bypass their home and businesses who need to operate there and to travel through the city to access their businesses. Please show the Pinecone Drive picture. This is a recent picture of Pinecone Drive. Last year, it finally got reparations. It had a similar break like this in 2019. In 2021, a local contractor was hired to repair it. During the building process, the residents expressed concerns that the road was not being built correctly. They could see that piles and heavy rock were needed to shore up that side, and they were not installed. This is what happened five months later. The road simply fell off. This picture demonstrated the builder's incompetence, and worse, our city engineer's inspection of this road was not competent. A new road should not be split in half of the heavy snowfall in a five month period. To this day, the people that live on Pinecone Drive are driving up this road. It looks wider in the picture than it really is. It's more like a donkey trail. It would barely be passable by fire truck or emergency services. It's a huge hazard. As you can see, there never was guardrails put on there. Uh, please show the picture of the Bailey Bridge exit. Bailey Bridge exit. Now we got a lovely new Bailey Bridge about two or three years ago. And as you can see, this is the exit of the bridge. You can see that the road slopes up um, just past the exit of the bridge. So when you come off that bridge, there was a dip in the road after the new construction and before the rise. And it was clearly an issue that could have been, if it had been built correctly, would not have been an issue with these high waters. But as it turned out, um, the, uh, the exit area needed to be, to have the road built up with, with a culvert to meet that 100 year water mark to be effective for high water years. So on May 13, with the evacuation order, we were trying to cross the bridge, so we were parked there waiting uh, for passage. They had, we had city crews out there, we waited to pass. We counted eight city trucks of various sizes, some of them dump trucks carrying material, and eight personnel. They had built a baffle at each side of the road at the base of the bridge and were standing watching it fill up and create a bathtub. Please show the Bailey Bridge bathtub picture. So you know the pond? I'm sorry? Is it the pond? Oh, it might be the pond, yes, thank you, yes. Bathtub pond, yeah, okay. So this is what it would look like um, to someone who's maybe wanting to cross through there and not really knowing how deep it is. So the baffles on either side created like a pond or a bathtub and 
but I think our point is with the amount of equipment <coughs> and personnel and materials that were there, a culvert and appropriate rock could have been installed and a permanent solution created at that time. So we don't know if it's really all about lack of competency or if there's some demand to cut corners, but we want to bring it to your attention that we need um, some review of the process. These are just two examples of the neglect of our road conditions and residents' complaints, and there are many, many more. The reduced evacuation order opened up some areas but left Beauty Bay Golf Course inaccessible, as well as Hidden Trails Resort. Repairs to School Road could have been done earlier in May using local contractors. We know them to be competent and affordable, and we know they offered. Hidden Trails alone pays $13,000 a year in, in city taxes and is still not being supplied with a date to have access. We did investigations into the reluctance to repair, the manner in which contracts are awarded, competency of engineering inspections, and what repercussions are levied against contractors who do incompetent work. City tax revenue on Williams Road of about just 20 houses and some vacant land is 170,000 yearly. When residents call the city roads department for dust retardant, they're told, sorry, not in the budget. Sorry, not this year. Sorry, maybe next year. Uh, call again and get your name on the list. This has happened repeatedly. The residents are not being treated respectfully and we need council to intervene. City of Kenora's pamphlet states the entire budget for dust retardant is 40000 I think Williams Road is paying for that many times over and being refused the service. As an example of tax revenue that city collects from roads in the area, just a snapshot, James Road collectively pays 287400 every year. 287400 Pine Cove Drive comes off of James. Pine Cove Drive alone, the one with the split road, 76,000 yearly. And they've been driving on a road like that for two years. Grassy, Austin, and Schnarr, the 75 properties up there, 240,000 a year from, for tax revenue. Warona Road, 150. Ritchie and Lawton together, 150,000. Williams Road, 170,000. So finally, pulling this all together, we would like council to supply us with property owners' names and addresses of all the properties north of the bypass in the city of Kenora. The names and addresses used by the tax department to send tax notices. We've been denied this by city staff when we approach personally. We know it is legally public record and we have the right to access, but we do not have the leverage to get the information, but we expect you do and can. Secondly, we would like to have the total tax revenue for the properties north of the bypass. Again, this is public record. We have not been able to procure this information and we expect you can. Thirdly, we would like one person on council here today, at least until the election in October, to volunteer to be the person to look out for our rights and concerns and requests as citizens of the city of Kenora. And we want a three year road upgrade plan supplied and guaranteed on our major access roads, East Malik and Coker, School, Essex, James, Peterson, Gautier, Beggs and Anderson to avoid future mishaps like this year. We believe much of the crisis this year was man-made as these water levels have existed in the past 100 years. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, your comments. <coughs> Does Council have any questions or comments? Um, yeah, thank you, Sorry. Deputy Mayor. Um, when, you have, when you talk about representation on the Council, you are aware that the City does not have a ward system, That's right? right. That's all right. I'm asking for a volunteer. Yeah. All Council represents um, all of the community yes. and of course our phones are always open for conversation yes. and you have um, requested support from council so we're going to take this under advisement okay. um, and the system of government governance within the city and council mm -hmm. this council is responsible for uh, is a governance role and we're responsible for um, policy mm -hmm. and staff is responsible for the organizational or the um, operational work out there 
I, I, am, um, I understand the concerns um, within the community. This has been a very difficult year, an abnormal year, certainly a sign of things to come. Staff have worked very hard this year to um, ensure that people have access um, under very difficult conditions, staff sorted because of COVID and such. So I'm sure that once this situation is over, um, there will be a debrief on where there can be improvements and looking at the budget because budget is policy. So that's where we will look at it. So thank you for your presentation. Um, I know it's been very difficult for many people this year. Thank you. Any further comments? No, sir. Okay, thank, thank you. you for your comments. I would I just say thank you very much, Ms. Cope. I appreciate the feedback. Yeah. You'll receive a response back from me. Thank you. I'd within a few that. days. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And you might note that we will have an update on the flood, flooding status update uh, coming shortly in this meeting. Uh, moving on, uh, Corporate Services and Finance, item 1.1, Q1 Investment Report. Charlotte, I would imagine that's you. Yes, yes it is. Um, so quarter one, March 2022, um, I'm sure you realize that um, all investments have experienced negative market impacts in 2022. Um, we've had market deterioration um, largely because of two key components. Um, the Bank of Canada started raising interest rates and as you know, they're, they're not done. This negatively impacted the markets as higher rates reduce economic growth and it's lowering earnings in, in corporations um, and also creating a, a bit of instability. And the second, of course, is the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine, which again creates significant uncertainty in, in the global markets. And of course, um, this is going to impact our investments. So um, sort of having said that, uh, we'll move on to the Prosperity Trust Fund investment in the one sector group of funds. The market value took a downturn uh, to the tune of about 1.5 million over 36 million. Uh, again, this is not an, a realized loss. Uh, this is an unrealized loss and is not a permanent erosion. Um, markets bounce back. Uh, this time, it may take a little longer. But we're we have no intention of divesting, so we'll you know we'll be able to ride it out. Um, should also mention that the return since inception on these um, funds, which we've had now with with the prudent investor about a year and a half, uh, the return is since inception is four uh, percent. The next group of investments we still have over. Uh, $4.6 million with RBC Dexia. Uh, the market value took a downturn of um, almost $84,000. Um, again, hopefully this will bounce back. We are slowly going to be uh, liquidating these funds as, as we draw down for uh, debt purposes. Um, but again, we still have funds invested here. I'm not keen on liquidating any of these as yet. Uh, I think we need to take a pause because we are in a low market situation and until it bounces back, it just doesn't make sense for us to divest in any of this. Uh, the rate of return on, since inception, and of course we've had this money in there for, for many, many years, is 2.38%. We also have general fund investments with the one group of funds. Again, another downturn of uh, almost 960,000. Unrealized loss, not a permanent erosion. Um, markets should bounce back in the midterm to, to longer term. The return since inception, and we've got two funds here, uh, is 8.2% on one and 1.2% on the other. Um, so again, the 8.2 is, is still looking fairly good. We also have a high interest savings account with the one funds and the balance is uh, almost 7.2 million at, at the end of March. And that's it. 
All right. Questions? Andrew? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Charlotte. It's, uh, can you hear me? Yes. No. Um, so uh, thanks for the update because uh, I think everybody's having the same problem in the market. Um, so we only have to worry about this at year end, right? Once we look at doing um, adjustments, uh, you know, market versus uh, book value and so on and so forth. So uh, this is just an update where it's at as of March 31st, I'm assuming. Um, so if it's like this at the, at the end of the year, um, that's when we would have to, there would be a, more of a concern, I suppose. Yeah, we would have to uh, write down investments to market value okay. and, you know, just hoping that things bounce back. Now, the other thing I should bring your attention to is, um, you know, we do earn interest income and, uh, you know, dividend revenue. Um, again, most of it is recorded in that fourth quarter. Um, or in the second quarter. So we're, we're not seeing a lot of that income right now on the March 31st statement. It's, it's negligible right now because that's just how the, the investment is accrued okay. uh, or the income is accrued to these investments. So we also have, you know, that income to offset any write downs. Okay, thank, thanks Charlotte. Any further questions, comments, Council? Okay. Uh, moving on to item 1.2, April 2022, financial reports. All right, so these are the financial statements at the end of April. Um, I'm just going to bring to your attention some um, differences that you may have noticed on the statements. Uh, when you look at HR, uh, you'll see that there's, there's going to be uh, larger discrepancies in terms of uh, a difference from the budget or the uh, variance from the budget. This is the department where we have the uh, vacancy recovery, and that's built into the HR budget. So, um, you know, we'll look at uh, maybe a different department or, or setting it up differently so it's, it stands out by itself. Um, roads departments, uh, they're all below budget right now, and you're probably wondering why, but just to remind you that flooding expenses uh, we're not, uh, didn't start to, we didn't start to incur flooding expenses until May. So, you know, we'll start to see um, some, some increases in expenses there. Um, and just so you know, we've set up separate accounts for roads, for sewer and water, and for Kent's emergency services. We set up separate accounts so that we can record all flooding expenses and in the event that we do get disaster relief funding that we can easily report on everything we have spent. So you will see that start to kick in uh, the next month. And I, I just want to jump, front, Charlotte, I just want to jump in really quick. Um, can you share just what the threshold is for the disaster relief funding, just so that everybody's it's aware? A, it's about three quarters of a million dollars before we were eligible for uh, any funding. So we're trying to be extremely careful in, in reporting absolutely everything that we spend. Um, because, it, you know, you don't want to be at 650000 and, you know, not qualify. But, um, and again, I'd rather spend nothing. but. Um, we are trying to capture every, absolutely everything. So. And so just to be clear there, the province has a very specific list of eligible expenses. And so if something is not eligible, we can't claim it. And as Charlotte said, we have, I believe it's 3% of tax levy roughly, which is in that 750000 $760,000 range. So we need to incur that amount in eligible expenses to be able to tap into disaster relief funding. So. We have not received any disaster relief funding as of yet. So I just want to be very clear yeah. with that. And we're not sure that we'll be eligible, but we've certainly included um, expenses like the uh, rec center, um, you know, evacuation center, those kind of expenses. We're, you know, we're trying to capture everything that we can so that we can say, look, you know, this is what we did in Korea. And we're not done yet. Um, it, it could be. It'll be a couple of months before we um, even know where we're at, but certainly um, 
what I will report to you from here on in is what we have spent in these separate accounts, and, and they're going to be obvious to us because that's all we're putting in there. Um, so we can report to you as time goes on, and we are having our employees code their wages to these accounts, so that will be included as well. We have a good contact with uh, Municipal Affairs, and so if we have any questions in terms of eligibility, um, we can easily ask them and know that we're on the right track. Okay, um, Harbour Front uh, looks a little higher than last year. We've already made one payment for the flower contractor. Um, recreation departments, we do have a new uh, system and March and April revenue have yet to be recorded. I think we just received the March, so I think they're working through some kinks there. And uh, tourism facilities, a little above, um, what's expected because maintenance at the Discovery Center on the HVAC and we did some security work at the Pavilion. Otherwise, expenses and revenues are fairly much in line with, with what it, what's expected uh, after four months of operations. That's it, Charlotte? Yeah. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Smith? Yeah, Carl, I just wanted to follow up on your comments about the um, the disaster relief fund and declaring an emergency so that the city would be eligible for some expenses. How does that, and just keeping in mind the deputation we just had, sure. how does that impact indivi in individuals, our, our citizens? Once we declare, are they, does that put them in a better position to um, look for funding for some of their expenses? So great question. So there's two streams. So one is for municipalities. Um, so we are working on that. There is another stream for individuals and we've seen Fort Francis tap into this program. The city has been trying to, the province is the one that makes the declaration of, of uh, they, they declare that we are, they activate the program for us is the word that I'm looking for, sorry. Um, I, I do not understand why Fort Francis has been able to get their program activated and we have not. My guess might be that Fort Francis was able to activate theirs before the writ dropped and our emergency has been firmly within the writ period. That's just, I don't know that to be true. I'm just sharing uh, something around timing that may be impacting our inability to get the province to activate that program for us. <coughs> but what's important for council to know and for the public to know is that city administration has been working very hard with Emergency Management Ontario and the ministry in charge of that program to try and get that program activated for individuals. Um, so, so that's really what's going on there. So I don't have, uh, we're hoping that that program will be activated and I don't know if Kent or Heather, uh, who have been, you know, they've been on the ground trying to work and get that program activated. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Go ahead. All right. Yeah, I can just speak to what you have yeah. done so far. Sure. So. We have been working with the ministry. Kent and I have had uh, conversations with representatives from the ministry of Pillars and Housing. Um, and where it's been left is that they need to send an inspector here. Um, and they were not prepared to do that until the roads were reopened and they could assess the uh, impacts. So really, we've reached out to them again to say we have roads open. So um, now is the time to come and make that assessment and make that problem available. And as far as the municipal side goes, you know, as I mentioned, there are eligible expenses and ineligible expenses, and, and Marco may be able to speak to this a little bit more than I can, but my understanding is um, a, a lifting of the road grade may very well not be eligible mm -hmm. because they're not considering that to be driven by the emergency. They're considering that to be something that the city is doing to, to build up the roadway. So we would need something more akin to a washout or something like that to be eligible. So that those are some of the challenges presented by the eligibility criteria of the program. Maybe something that we want to advocate on at a later date, but that is one of the challenges that we have to access funding for this. Marco, would you like to chime in on that? Yeah, the way I interpret the guidelines through that uh, disaster relief funding is they will only uh, consider, I guess, any kind of infrastructure work uh, in terms of putting back the assets to the way they were prior to the uh, to the flood event or, or disaster, I guess. So in terms of you know raising grades, adding culverts, and improving the system, uh, I think it's a, it's a slam dunk that they're probably not going to consider those types of, of expenditures and, and improvements to the roads. So in this case here, an example would be, yeah, you're better off to have the road totally wash out 
and, and bring that road back into service serviceability again to, to the elevation and the construction it was prior to the event than it is to have water come up over it and try and raise the road. So yeah, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head there that there are certain criteria within those guidelines for disaster relief that makes it a little more complicated, a little um, less accommodating, I guess, for municipalities to fix their infrastructure. So I think maybe the distinction there is fixing what you had versus improving uh, the infrastructure going forward or during that event. We think it's important just that council understands that and the public understands that. I can tell you speaking with Charlotte and Marco who have experienced some flooding with the municipality before, that is some of the challenges that we've had in trying to claim disaster relief funding. But what I can assure council and the public of is as Charlotte said, we are tracking all of those expenses and we are going to make as uh, compelling of an argument as we can for why we've done the work that we've done and why it was directly attributable to the flood. So stay tuned on that, but I, I do think that that piece of education here this morning it, it is helpful for council to understand. It's probably, I know we've had flooding before, but this does seem to be a little bit more widespread, affecting more roadways than maybe we've had in the past. It has required a certain uh, level of effort that maybe we haven't seen in the past. So stay tuned on that, but I hope that answers your question. Council. Yeah, and two things just as follow up is, um, perhaps the data over the years to show that this is a normal event which is probably not going to be an abnormal event in coming years, might support um, some of the work um, in rebuilding those um, roads that might help, just comes to mind. And um, considering, again, considering the deputation we had, that's going to be good communication going forward to the public is we are working on your behalf. This is what we're trying to do and this is what's happening to up, up to date. So I think it all ties together. But that's really good information, Kyle. So thank you. Okay. I'll support you. Yeah, um, I, I'm just. I had a couple questions, but I'm wondering if I should wait till the yeah. the item that you mentioned on the agenda, like sure. about the flood update. Yeah, sorry, that that was mostly yeah. money based. So what would we'll, sure, well, we'll let you carry sort on. my questions, oh, okay. but I'll well, I'll, I'll hold them until okay. uh, until we get further onto the agenda where we're actually talking about that particular, this particular issue. Okay. okay. So, sorry, Charlotte, you just, you sort of touched on that with your comments, so I thought we would just jump off there briefly, but I'll let you pick it up. All good, Charlotte, you have everything covered here. Thank you. Any, any further questions beyond this? Yeah. Uh, so on the revenue side, the user fees for environmental services, mm -hmm. are we concerned about that? It's a little over 6%, a difference in variance. Uh, year over year at this point like up until the end of April or is that a seasonal thing Charlotte or do you um, set up the accrual and reverse set up the accrual in December and reverse it in January so um, okay now that uh, the budget's done we're, we're full steam into you know completing the year end and, and I anticipate that will be done before the next set of statements okay thank you Anything further, Council? <coughs> okay, moving on. Uh, flooding status updates, item 3.1, Marco. Yeah, I guess I was uh, requested to provide an update to Council on certain events, I guess, over the last few weeks or month or so during the flooding. Um, so the, the beginning of the report pr provides a little bit of background and, and the different kind of situations we're seeing out there. Black Sturgeon uh, Lake situation in terms of its uh, increase in water levels. Um, is more of a, a localized uh, area effect with the uh, precipitation and, and the large amount of snowfall that we had over the, the winter. Um, as over the last few weeks here, we've seen you know, the decline in the water um, for about eh, maybe the last week to week and a half. And that's based on, I guess, the local drainage basin uh, finally catching up in terms of its snow melt and the precipitation we've seen over the spring and the amount of outfall coming out of those lakes. Um, in contrary to the, to the Lake of the Woods situation, it's more of a regional uh, issue where that drainage basin is quite large. It goes all the way down to, I think it starts up near Atticoke and through the Rainy River uh, system at, at the south end of the lake. So we're seeing those water levels uh, Obviously, they've risen over the last few weeks, and as per our last bit of information coming in from some of our, our road patrols and whatnot, we see those water levels on Lake of the Woods 
stabilized, I guess, at least for the last few days with the lack of precipitation and whatnot. And we were actually expecting another little bump uh, late last week or, or early into this week based on the large thunderstorms and, and whatnot that they had in the southern basin around Rainy River and, and, and Fort Francis, which we haven't quite seen on the radar as per our measurements that we're taking at certain locations along the lake and, and flooded roads and whatnot in the south end of town. So that's that's good news, I guess, in the short term. Um, so basically the report here was written last week. Um, I don't think there's a lot changed since the report. So I guess we'll just go through the areas of, of work and locations uh, that we have put uh, effort into uh, rehabilitating and raising. Uh, so chronologically, on, on May 10th, I guess our first event uh, in regards to roads that occurred was the wash on the school road. Um, that was handled with the city crews that day and I think within six to eight hours the road was reopened. Um, following that, uh, from May 12th to the 24th, uh, we hired a contractor to raise the um, East Mellick Road just north of Essex Road. Uh, that was uh, I guess our first grade raise and our first attempt to try and open up road systems within uh, that northeast sector of the city. Um, that specific location of work uh, consisted of about 200 meters of length of road that was raised approximately 30 inches to get it up out of the water and starting uh, I guess to make avenues in to, to get residents back in uh, to their homes which opened up uh, I guess that area of town from the bypass up to Bells Point Road, which is just north of the Portier Bridge. Um, on May 16th and 17th, we hired a, two different contractors to work at two different locations on the west side of the Reddit Road, being Carlton Road at Alcock Lake and Anderson uh, Road just west of Carlton Road. Those two locations uh, came up on our radar with our normal route patrols and uh, we were finding that those two locations were key uh, 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 locations, I guess, that water was starting to build up and starting to get close to the edge of the road. So those two locations we did in a proactive manner to ensure that people on the west side of the Reddit Road and the Carleton-Anderson Road loop uh, would not be stranded similar to, to the situation that we saw on the uh, east side of Black Sturgeon uh, Lakes. Um, that specific work uh, entailed about 80 meters on the Anderson Road that was raised, uh, about 30, 30 inches or so. And uh, the other section that was done was about 120 meters in length. And uh, these grade raises ranged anywhere from 30 to 20 inches to try and make sure that we had some freeboard at those locations because they are two low points. Well, I should say the Anderson Branch Road is a low point next to the uh, Winnipeg River system and the Carleton Road area. The Alcock Lake was receiving so much water for runoff and snow melt that it was starting to build up right at the Carleton Road just prior to it spilling into the, uh, the Winnipeg River system. Uh, subsequent to that, on the week of May 24th, a contractor was brought in to raise the East Mellick Road uh, about a half a kilometer north of the Portier Bridge. Um, and it consisted of about a 20 inch grade raise over about 300 meters of length. And this further opened up uh, the road system uh, into the northeast sector of the city. Um, so it provided access all the way up the East Mellick Road, uh, including the Coker Road, all the way to the Kelly Road, where, where the uh, at that time there was still uh, water over the road on Coker Road at Kelly Road. On uh, May 30th, city crews were dispatched to uh, address the low-lying bathtub area that was presented in our, our uh, deputation today on the west side uh, of the, the Coker Bridge. Likewise, uh, on the week of May 30th, the contractor was secured to make repairs to the school road uh, between East Mellick Road and the Essex Road where there was about six to seven 
areas of the road that were punched through with clay boils, heavy rutting, uh, you know, due to the saturation uh, from the rainfalls and the snow melt and the amount of traffic using that road over time. Um, so with that work, uh, with the school road then opened, um, accessibility was gained through East Mellick and the school road to double back to the Essex Road in the Beauty Bay kind of golf course area all the way down to uh, Hooterville Trail. So that opened up a, a fairly large piece of, of uh, road infrastructure for accessibility purposes for those specific residents. Um, on June 2nd, there was a failed culvert uh, that was uh, that had put Burrowinder Drive down to one lane, which is located on Dufresne Island. That was another kind of emergency type of repair we needed to do to make sure that that, uh, that specific road wasn't cut off because it is a dead end. As soon as you come off the bypass, Burrowinder Road is a dead end. There's only one way in, one way out. The uh, final bit of work that we have done with contractors to date was uh, located on the, the Bags and Essex Loop, uh, where one section of roadway uh, was repaired by a contractor again, uh, where there was a washout and exposed corduroy, so the logs that keep the, uh, the road stable underneath the gravel surfaces and whatnot were exposed and uh, needed to be rehabilitated in terms of graveling and and uh, reinforcing that section of roadway to open it up. And likewise, you know, a several, a few kilometers from that location, we had a failed culvert right across the road, uh, which made it impassable. And again, that culvert was uh, replaced on uh, June 3rd, I believe. So basically to date, uh, there are two sections uh, of roadway that are still closed. That being Coker Road at the Kelly Road at Essex Road, just north of Hooterville Trail. Um, getting into the urban area, there's a, a few areas of concern. Um, I guess the, the most prominent one being Sadesky Road, which has been closed for several days now with about 10 inches of water over it. Uh, that's due to, again, the rising lake levels, which have again pushed up the, the elevation of the Lawrence Creek, which has now inundated Sadesky Road at its lowest point. Uh, and again, that's about a 10 inch uh, standing water on Sadesky Road, uh, which again has been closed for several days now. Uh, the other area of concern we have and are keeping an eye on is 2nd West Bay Road. It has probably two to three inches of standing water on it now. Uh, we were expecting that one probably to go underwater, but luckily enough, the, the lake levels have stabilized over the last few days, but we are st still keeping an eye on that one. Um, other areas that have been affected is obviously the Q8 ball fields, uh, the Q8 wharf next to Two Bears Marina. Um, another big impact, I guess, to the city's drainage and storm systems is the, uh, the area of Dingwall 4. It's uh, quite low in elevation. And currently what's happening now is the drainage ditch located behind the, the Ford dealership there is now filled up probably three to three and a half feet of standing water uh, due to the fact that the creek has come up so far, the water has come up the storm pipes all the way from Lawrence and Creek at the former uh, uh, Luby's Hotel, or I'm not sure what it's called now. But the storm pipe from the creek at that location is now backed up all the way uh, behind Luby's store, uh, behind the KFC, and has now filled the ditch in behind Dingwall Fort. And now the storm system out on Highway 17 East in front of the Days Inn and Dingwalls is experiencing water right to the surface uh, of the roadway. And those puddles you see in the Days Inn lot and in partially into, uh, into Dingwall Fort's parking lot, that is lake level. So we are keeping an eye on that. It's not like we can do much for Dingwall Ford or whatnot, but we're just trying to keep eyes on our, is water rising? Is it going down or whatnot? And uh, about a week or so ago, I think Heather had, had uh, notified Dingwall Ford just to put them on notice that saying, you know, this isn't a city 
infrastructure issue. This is now a lake level. It's not a blocked culvert. It's not a blocked storm system or whatnot. So we wanted to make sure that they would have adequate notification if they had to do any kind of mitigating purposes for any kind of flooding that may occur due to, due to the rising lake. Uh, likewise, uh, the other area that we've been keeping an eye on, but is very similar to the Dingwall Ford, is the Hyundai dealer dealership on Railway Street. Now with the, the creek level coming up, the water has now progressed through the culvert on Gould Road. and is now inundating that corner of Gould Road and Railway Street at the corner of the Hyundai dealership. So if you drive by there on Railway Street, you'll see a portion, of, a great portion of, of the corner. There's the southwest corner of their lot is now inundated with water and again it's not due to a lack of city infrastructure it's just that the lake has come up that far and it's starting to back up you know certain drainage systems um, the other area that we're keeping an eye on too is uh, golf course road uh, just past Glen Cameron Drive which is the I guess the quicker way into the to the uh, uh, Rat Portage uh, Marina um, currently it's been stable again with, with water levels and it's pretty much lapping right up to the shoulders of the road so we are keeping an eye on that. Uh, if the water does come up obviously we'll have to close that and uh, it, there shouldn't be any threat to the, to the reserve or the, the, the marina and whatnot because they've got a, a secondary access road through Rat Portage Road so uh, that won't be as, as impactful, I guess, as some other road closures. Uh, the other areas we're keeping an eye on is Herbash Road, just east of uh, the Sadesky Road. And again, it's a low-lying area that will take quite a bit of water. And if the you know, lake continues to, to rise, that'll probably be the next road or potential next road that might go underwater in the south end of town. So we're keeping an eye on that one. To date, we're, we're still good. I believe the the upper range of those culverts are still functional, so we're not too bad at that point. Uh, the other area we're keeping an eye on too is the Gould Road. We have a set of, of four or five culverts across uh, Gould Road, uh, guessing maybe a, a couple of kilometers beyond Railway Street and uh, maybe a half a kilometer north of, of uh, Transmitter Road. That takes quite a bit of a drainage area kind of to the northeast uh, of the city. Um, again, those, those uh, water levels are still stable, uh, but they are quite high compared to normal. Uh, so we're hoping that as the creek builds up where these culverts spill into Lawrence and, Lawrence and Lake, that uh, you know, we don't have any issues there. But again, something to, to keep an eye on and watch on. Um, during our, our uh, flood meetings, uh, join, uh, Stace has joined in, uh, in in a few occasions to kind of discuss the uh, the other parks and docks infrastructure and taking, I guess, measures to mitigate certain risks and, and whatnot. I don't know if you want to sure, add up in words about uh, what you've done with docks and parks. Yeah, so we did a complete review of all of our docks just to have a look at things. Uh, we um, struggled to get barrels just like everybody has. Uh, I believe we procured uh, 20 barrels and we strategically placed them on uh, docks where we were concerned about um, them giving away from the cribs. Floaters are fine, but it's really where it gets attached to the shore that becomes a problem. Um, we've left the ramps open um, with the exception of Portage Bay and the thought there is that you can actually do a two-person launch, right? One person goes in the boat, uh, boat goes in the water, the person who's in the boat holds on to the dock, they push the boat forward to the ramp and then someone gets to the front and, and then away you go. Um, we have uh, closed wherever there's wood that's underwater and posted signs. Uh, rationale there, there is if uh, wood is underwater when the sun comes out the algae is going to uh, breed there very very quickly so from a risk of a slip and fall standpoint it gets very slippery quick. If you look at Kuwait for example at the wharf it's all concrete uh, up until the pier's edge so we mark the pier's edge and the, the feeling there is it's you're, you, yes, you're walking through water, but it's not like uh, on wood where it's very, very slippery. So, um, yeah, so we'll just continue to monitor. Uh, things are slowing down. It's still rising, but it appears to be slowing down. And, um, yeah, we'll just keep an eye on things. 
So I guess during our, our, our flood uh, meetings at the SLT level, we've come up with, uh, I guess, a certain uh, warning system, I guess, if you want to call it, uh, more based towards the roads infrastructure in which uh, you know, we'll hit certain key elements of, of public notification, I guess, in regards to those various conditions. So it starts at an evacuation alert when the water is seen to be up to the road, but not over the road. Um, an evacuation warning when there's water over the road, but less than six inches or 15 centimeters. And then an evacuation order in a road closed when the water over the road or on the road is, is uh, six inches or more. And then there's other situations where we have closed roads, not because of specific uh, water, uh, standing water events or flooding, but more so due to precipitation events where there's washouts and, and just general maintenance needed that there's no standing water, but there is some detriment to the road, whether it's a washout or some defect on the road that needs to be uh, uh, taken care of. So that could go all the way up to a road close depending on the, the condition of that road and, and the state it's in at any given time prior to its repair. Um, so we were expecting last week by uh, Lake of the Woods Control Board kind of reporting and, and investigation into their websites for, for water levels. I think as early as mid to early last week they were indicating you know within the next five to seven days we should see water rise another six to eight inches which according to our observations at least out in the field at these key locations that we're monitoring I think we've we've kind of uh, you know experienced stable conditions as opposed to, to levels increasing so um, are we going to hit the 1950 flood well I guess that's what you know yet to be seen um, I guess the other concern that we do have, I guess, in regards to docks is some of our, our downtown infrastructure in terms of our wharfs, where we're, we're keeping an eye on that also, especially the, uh, the Main Street Wharf where we have two, or uh, what's the name of the Houseboat Adventures. Uh, you know, we're concerned about that specific location just based on the size of those, those vessels and whatnot tied up to the wharf. You know, we want to make sure that uh, they've been notified to, to maybe come up with an option or a plan to, to maybe vacate that wharf in case the water gets too high. Um, from what I've seen in previous photos, I, I think we're, we're maybe about a foot lower or maybe a foot and a half lower than the 1950 flood, just based on photographs I've seen in the past on, on the Main Street Wharf where it was inundated or, or covered with water. And looking at the other day, it looks like we maybe have about a foot of freeboard right now on the, the Main Street Wharf. So, you know, if you get another eight inches of, of increase of water level, we might have to be looking at some, some other <coughs> impacts here and, and, and address those accordingly. So, can I just pick up on that? So, the Main Street Wharf is a color system. So, uh, it's made to fluctuate with water. And as you know, when west wind comes through there or something like that by Bush Island, the waves come through there pretty hard. So that, that it all, it, it floats other than the main pier itself. So every, you've got ramps coming down the east side, west side, and then on the south side where um, uh, houseboat adventure is, it's all heavy, heavy colors. So that, that's allowed to go uh, or to float. Uh, Matheson Street Pier does not have as much room. Uh, so we've mitigated some of the risk there by putting uh, tires in so that it allows it to ride up the side. Uh, Matheson Street will become a problem before Main Street becomes a problem. So I, I guess in wrapping up, you can kind of see the various events in the report, kind of a, a chronological uh, date of events, you know, the amount of time and effort and, and resources and, and uh, an effort that's gone into some of the repair of these roads over the last few weeks. Uh, so that's what we, I think the basis of this report was to try and get council up to speed on, you know, how much effort and, and time we put into reopening these roads uh, to the best of our ability here. I have a few comments, but I'll wait for council to go there. Council for you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Marco. Um, I mean, it's, it's one of these things where you can do all the things you want, but I mean, 
everything's out of your control, right? Or out of everybody's control, and hopefully people realize that. Uh, when we talk about, uh, hopefully at the end of the period where water is actually um, lower to a point where we can take a look at some of our road infrastructure and, and have a better inspection, um, can we at some point, I, I mean back to council on that because we could be t talking about a lot of money and it could be money that's coming out of uh, whatever except for flood relief from the provincial government um, look at areas or have a report where you show areas and that and um, put together a plan where we can at least incorporate into um, the long-term capital plan going forward can't do everything tomorrow but uh, look at some of these and mitigate for the future and that because who knows like with climate change and everything else uh, is this the new norm? I don't know. Right. Like, I mean, you know, we get another um, bad winter and a bit of rain and, you know, we're right back where we started again. Um, because if there are areas in that and we keep going back, and I'm just looking from a cost-benefit analysis, if we're going back and repairing roads all the time, is it better in certain areas to spend the money and make those remediations and, and if we're looking at different if, if we're going from a hundred year flood to I don't know maybe the new norm is going to be 125 years or something who knows mm -hmm. um, it, it, like it, I, I guess I'm just wondering uh, is that money better spent uh, to look at fixing some of the and I know we can't fix them all like in one year but take the worst ones and start looking at what we can do to uh, be a little more prepared for future weather events. So Councillor Poirier, we are working on that as we speak and we will have something for Council in the very near future. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think what we're, what we're looking at here is probably doing a, a what I call as a, a roads needs study. Potentially that would, would encompass roads north of the bypass. Mm -hmm. um, I think that might entail uh, hiring a consultant to come up with a comprehensive plan because I think there's two two avenues of work we should be looking at. One is, you know, the, the current uh, conditions of low-lying roads that are, are susceptible to flooding, like we've experienced this time. And there's others, uh, from what I understand, in, in the rural area north of the bypass that are more concerned about, uh, you know, maybe that weren't affected by the flooding but are, are concerned about poor road conditions. You know, not enough gravel, not enough ditching, um, you know, and just general maintenance and upkeep of those roads in addition to those areas that need very specific improvements like grade raising and whatnot. So I think we have to look at uh, an overall encompassing plan mm -hmm. uh, that would include grade raises for these kinds of situations, but also ongoing uh, maintenance of those roads on, on, like you said, where is it best spent? Uh, what is, you know, if we're looking at a three to five year capital plan, where do you start? You know, where is the most important areas to be a, a addressed in a timely manner? What can maybe wait a little bit? So I think uh, in discussions with Kyle, that's that's what he was getting at. I think we're going to have to kind of sit down and, and uh, you know, come up with some type of a, a plan and a report that potentially as early as you know 2023 we can start like you say planning uh, for the future in, in a three to five year plan and, and have various costs and, and uh, locations kind of keyed out on on a priority basis for sure. Councillor Smith. Uh, yeah thanks so Mayor. Um, that's encouraging to hear that and um, from the de deputation this morning as we know that we're going to have to yeah. debrief and move forward with different strategies and looking where the gaps are, um, presumably for the up and coming operating budget for next year. And I guess that's why we left your room and didn't um, vote on a five year capital budget because did we know this was going to yeah, happen? No. So now we do, but yeah, definitely. And, and that's what the community needs to know is there's going to be lessons learned. Um, we'll be looking at those gaps, we'll debrief and um, perhaps more attention is needed on those on those northern roads. So we've definitely heard the public when it comes to that. And when you're talking about going down to Corduroy, we know that that's when you can tell that roads, um, people have been building in swamps. Yeah. 
and um, I think that's important to know. But um, one thing I want to, I'm not sure you're aware of, and I'm just going to talk about my own neighborhood, the West Bay Road. So you know that water f that fuddles from out of Portage Bay, Lake of the Woods, Portage Bay, under the culvert at Happy Jacks, and down into Mink Bay, and usually flows from underneath the tunnel, just up from on the railway tracks um, from Second West Bay, usually flows into the Winnipeg River. But when the water gets this high, the Winnipeg River is flowing back into that basin and that's what's that's causing, what's causing that flooding. Yep, no for sure. But on, on a on a happier note, the kids are catching tadpoles on that road right now. <laughs> so, and I remember we did that when the road used to flood when we were kids. So and again Marco, as I, I said to the deputant, um, council's role right now is to step back and let staff do their work. And that's what we have been doing. But once staff have kind of got caught up, I'd like to do a tour of some of these areas, and perhaps other councillors like to, because I'm not really at that familiar with those roads mm -hmm. north of um, north of the bypass. But yeah, when you're, you're all caught up and, and you're willing to give us a tour someday, I'd certainly like to do that. Sure. Yeah. So uh, thank you and your staff for the work that you've been doing. I appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor McMillan. Yeah, just, just a couple of comments, and, and uh, Kyle, just going back to what you were saying about um, staff are working on a report, I think the, very, the positive thing is, is in the uh, Sustainability Action Plan, climate impact is addressed. It's, it's foremost in our STRAT plan to address uh, these issues, and having sat in on the uh, FCM conference the past few days, it, that's a critical need across the country. Is, uh, is climate change and the impact of climate change. But, I'll be careful how I say it, but I, I listened to deputation this morning and I respect the fact that there's frustration and it's difficult when you can't get to your home, but we, it's important to commend our staff. Like, I'm sure it hasn't been a five day week for staff for about three months, maybe, or something like that. and. Uh, as a counselor, I'm, I'm happy with the communications I get, the regular updates. Um, we get them, respecting residents' um, concerns and whatever, but I, I really commend our staff and our team for uh, keeping on top of this and doing the best we can, because nobody ordered this up uh, uh, through, uh, through Costco or anything, so we're hit, we're hit pretty bad are a lot of the areas in, in around us so I really appreciate the efforts thank you okay. yeah just a few points that I would like to share uh, first and foremost uh, you know we've got a team around you know the emergency management control group our, our team is exceptionally experienced mm -hmm. in these types of things and I feel really good about the personnel that we have and, and the decisions that we've made in leading through this emergency um, you know, some of the principles that we've applied, you know, as we've been going through this process, you know, how can we facilitate access to impacted areas uh, for emergency personnel? Um, you know, how is any intervention going to impact the integrity of the road? You know, these roads are, they're wet, the base isn't necessarily stable. We've seen that on some of the roads. Um, and in some of the roads that have been traveled on during the closures, we've seen significant damage been done, uh, which has now required us to go back and do more uh, you know, remediation. Um, the safety of employees and contractors has been top of mind. And, uh, you know, general emergency management principles and general engineering principles. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you need to be an engineer, respectfully, Marco, to know that trying to build a road in, in you know, you know a foot or two feet of water is not the ideal circumstances that you'd want to be doing so in. So, um, you know, we have tried to you know, follow fundamental engineering principles as much as possible throughout this process, and we feel pretty good about what we've done. Um, I actually think we've we've taken a unique approach, and we've been fairly innovative and creative in how we've gotten gone on about that. I can tell you that um, we've received some inquiries from other jurisdictions about you know how are you carrying out this work under these conditions, um, and you know different jurisdictions have made different determinations about how they want to manage situations in their area. Um, I, I can just tell you as the Chief Administrative Officer, I'm very confident and very happy and pleased with how we've handled this uh, to date. Um, 
you know, over time we've developed, you know, this sort of system for, you know, the roads, which, you know, council would be familiar with, but I will share, share with members of the public, you know, uh, area, uh, road of concern, you know, something that we're monitoring, the water is up to the road. Uh, that then triggers into an evacuation warning when we see water, uh, you know, six inches over the road. Uh, an evacuation order slash road closed when uh, water gets above six inches and then road closed when that road you know we feel is no longer uh, safe to traverse so um, what's interesting about an emergency like this is it's sort of a slow burn you know it, it's it's not a okay we've got a fire and everybody needs to evacuate and there's a very that's a very rapid emergency this one's more of a slow burn and so um, what I would say to council and what I would say to members of the public is uh, the emergency management control group was meeting daily, um, you know, even during the weekends, during the early part of the emergency. Uh, we were considering information that we were receiving every day from Lake of the Woods Control Board, uh, from the ministry, from other sources, uh, from our staff with the measurements and the observations that they were making. Uh, and we used that information to inform the decisions that we were making. So there was certainly no uh, sitting on our hands. There was certainly no arbitrary decisions. Um, you know, there's always an opportunity to, uh, you know, debate decisions that are made. But what I would tell you is we, at all times, uh, debated issues. And there was, there was great discussion around the table and a lot of perspective shared on, on, you know, both sides. Do we go this way or do we go that way? very animated discussion and I think it always made sure that we ended up in a place where sort of everybody felt comfortable with the direction that we were moving and we made those decisions uh, with the information that we had uh, in the best interest of the city in the short and long term. So, um, you know, again, I, I would just like to commend the effort of the team. Uh, you know, it's, it's important to recognize that everybody also has their day jobs and so We've been trying to do our best to balance the emergency and also make sure that we're delivering, you know, services to the community. Uh, potholes have not stopped, street sweeping has not stopped, and there's lots of other services and programs that we offer to residents. And I, I think we've done an admirable job. Uh, absolutely, we will take the opportunity and have taken the opportunity as an emergency management control group to debrief lessons learned throughout the uh, emergency and we'll continue to do that uh, as we exit the emergency and start moving on to a long-term plan and the team uh, we've had great discussions and the team recognizes that the, the north needs some focus and we've so we're already shifting and starting to direct some of our attention there uh, but do want to acknowledge that we are still dealing with some situations particularly on the coker road uh, and particularly on the essex pass by hooterville there that we still we still have some decisions to make so the emergency, it's not done, and, and obviously the urban area is impacted now too. So just wanted to share those points for consideration because I think they're important. Um, you know, uh, restoring access uh, to residents is, is one uh, consideration that we have, and just want to make it clear to council and to members of the public that there's a lot of considerations that need to be made. And uh, again, I just, I feel that the group uh, did their best to take the information in, filter it, consolidate it, and make a decision that we all felt comfortable with and that we thought was in the best interest of the city. And um, I, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm proud of the work that the team has done and I appreciate council's, uh, you know, support and the representation that you have provided uh, for members of the public by continuing to pass on information that you're receiving from them, uh, asking questions to, to um, get the information to you and to members of the public. So I appreciate that as well. And the only other thing that I would add is we did have a meeting last night, uh, Chief Redman, uh, Acting Mayor Goss, and myself with the Lake of the Woods Control Board. We did have a sizable portion of the board there. I think there was only one individual missing, and we had a staffer from Ottawa as well. Um, ma mainly a reconnaissance mission, I would say. They're doing a tour all over the watershed to sort of get a sense for what's going on. Um, what I can share with you, you know, no, I'm not a prognosticator. I'm not a water basin expert. What they did share is that some of that volume that we were expecting to get from the south, from the Rainy Lake watershed, yeah, hasn't materialized. Um, it's not equal, but roughly right now, roughly as much water is coming into the Lake of the Woods is going out. So we do foresee some rise, but we anticipate it'll be a lot slower than what we've seen to date. Uh, of course, all of that can be thrown out the window if we see a very large precipitation event. Um, so that's the latest work, uh, latest information we have as of last night from the control board. I want to you know thank the control board for coming out and taking the time to uh, see some of our challenges. And uh, you know certainly um, you know they'll take that back. And uh, you know it's kind of difficult. There's not really much 
that can be done right now, and we are sort of at the mercy of the precipitation coming into the system. But um, I thought it was a productive meeting, and I'll leave it to Chief Redmond and, and Acting Mayor Goss if they have any other comments on last night. No, it was good to see them here, and I think they were kind of an eye opener for, for them seeing some of the high water spots that we showed them a number of different spots around the city. So it was uh, a good conversation and just uh, very good interest from that. I, I know there's a bit of a narrative that, um, you know, we have had flooding in the past. I do think it's really important to understand that the levels that we are seeing are historical mm -hmm. based on every piece of information that we have. So um, I think that's important. I, I think it's, um, it's different than some of the flooding events that we've had in the past, as I understand it, based on the information. Okay. Uh, I'm going to close it off with, uh, as a resident of the Carlton Road for 47 years, uh, I really do welcome a roads analysis for the, the roads north of the bypass. There are there are some issues that have, are, that are going to take some work, and it's going to take a, take an effort to fill some of them up. On the Carlton Road, I know about half a dozen spots where the uh, uh, bedrock is popping up, and I'm sure the radio operators can tell you exactly where every one of them is. Uh, I had two rather loud conversations, not on my end, but from uh, from uh, taxpayers. Uh, one from the Kelly Road, uh, Kelly Coker Road, and one from the Sadesky Road. And last night I did notice that there were people driving through the Sadesky Road section, uh, despite the road closed. And I understand that there are people doing the same thing at the Kelly Coker. Now, uh, I would assume that once we put up the road close sign, because there are structural issues, I understand, at the Kelly Coker, once they start to travel on that that road close sign, their li the liability now shifts from the city to the to the people who are driving. Is that's uh, I, I yes. believe it should. Yeah. Yeah. Those but roads are closed, and no one should be accessing those roads. That's why we've closed them. Yeah. Uh, so if you do access a closed road, uh, we really encourage residents to make sure that they understand the insurance you know implications for themselves. Yeah. Yeah, and at, at the start, uh, especially on the East Millick Road, I think our first closure near Essex, you know, our, our patrollers would come back the next day and find the signs moved off into the ditch or actually thrown yeah. into the ditch and whatnot. So, you know, they're, I, I think the signs have been staying a little, you know, more permanent now in their locations and, and people are heeding the advice or I guess taking their risk and, and going yeah. across those roads. but. Yeah, I guess there's two factors there is, is the safety of, of the, the vehicle and the driver going across a flooded road not knowing what's there. But it, it, like Kyle had indicated, you know, the more traffic driving on a flooded, soggy road is causing more damage to the, you know, it needs to be addressed in the future for sure. My other question was the Gould Sadesky Road. We were done, as one of the areas we looked at was that, that section of Sadesky Road last night. We drove by Superior Court Lane and I noticed that there's an awful lot of water in their yard. How does that impact our railway street uh, rehabilitation this year? At this point, I, I think we're still going to carry on. Uh, it's still uh, a few weeks away. I'm thinking, uh, based on the schedule that the, the contractor submitted, they might not be there for another month or so. So hopefully, some water levels will go down. Uh, I think railway street at that specific location is, is high enough to still work on, even though there's there's flooding in the adjoining lots and properties there. There might be some small section of storm sewer that we might not be able to get to that does drain out into the creek uh, through the case sports yard that was scheduled as part of that project. That may have to be delayed and maybe rescheduled till next year or another phase of railway street. So that's about the only impact we see right at this point in time. Thank you. Any further questions, council, comments? The, the only other thing I might offer to council is uh, there was a, an attachment to that report I think that that came late last yeah. night so the report might make a little bit more sense when you see the map and, and there's three or four or five different photos aerial photos that we were lucky enough to receive from the MNR just to kind of give you an idea of the the areas that were worked on and uh, the, the two major flooded areas being Essex at Hooterville and Kelly Road at uh, or Coker Road at Kelly Road yeah, and the last thing I would say, we're not alone, you know, Fort Francis, mm -hmm. uh, Rainy River, uh, Sioux Lookout, I mean, you know, all, all of these measures, evacuation orders and road closures and, and other measures are being taken in communities across the Northwest. It, it really, truly is a uh, historical type of situation. Okay, moving on, uh, item 4.1.
budget amendment. Um, successful 2022 successful funding projects. Please. Thank you. So, Council, the report before you today is related to a number of budget amendments, seven in total, uh, related to the funding uh, that we would have received through the NOHFC or Investment in Canada Infrastructure Program for the Kenora Rehabilitation uh, Centre project. Um, we have spoken about these projects on numerous occasions through uh, getting pro appropriate resolutions and such from NOHFC. Um, in an effort to give you as much detail as I can <coughs> in terms of the breakdown of um, where uh, not only the scope of work but the you know uh, what monies that we are going to leverage to pay for these projects to fulfill the city's obligation uh, as it relates to our portion of the funding. I've developed Schedule A, uh, which speaks to uh, what's going to occur in 2022, and similarly, uh, what is going to come from subsequent years. It's worth noting that the uh, rec center project is a multi-year project. It is, uh, can go up to five years long, so it's going to take a while to get through these projects. Um, from a timing perspective, uh, other than the museum, the intent would be that we'd be able to do portion and start to draw down on some of these monies on, on all of these projects, with the exception of the museum move project, which we would put off till next summer, just from a timing perspective. Uh, this is a very thorough, very detailed, uh, uh, report. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So questions, comments. Uh, the total is six million four hundred ninety-six thousand four hundred ninety-nine dollars and fifty-six cents. And, and again, just want to acknowledge the great work, work of staff and, and appreciate Stacy. It was kind of like a beautiful mind trying to put this report together and <laughs> um, make it all sort of make sense. But so appreciate the work there. You know, this is just a, a really good news story to bring six and a half million dollars into the city, um, you know, reducing the burden on taxpayer dollars. That beautiful mind com comment is going to haunt you, you know. <laughs> uh, okay, moving on to the next one. The Hings new to the lease renewal. Yes, uh, thank you. The report uh, before you, Council, is related to a one-year lease extension. Typically, this would have come to you in January of the year. Um, it, uh, it was delayed due to uh, some uh, procurement changes that we were making, new uh, template documents that we were uh, going through. So it is a, um, it's for the property adjacent to Hings. That's where they put their, uh, their garbage bin there. Um, the annual income uh, that we generate from this is $471, and it represents a 3% increase year over year. Money. And uh, there's a map there to show you exactly where it is. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. No questions? Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Uh, moving on, development services, 5.1, acquisition of land. Adam. Okay. Uh, so the intent of this report is to proceed um, with an offer to purchase of uh, 38 uh, various pins or parcels of land in which uh, the municipality largely has um, uh, municipal infrastructure over. Um, so this is, as noted in the title of the report, was formerly in the, uh, the name of the Western Ontario Lumber Limited Company. Um, after uh, uh, that company did dissolve, it was vested with the Crown, to which the Crown is now uh, in a position to proceed in transferring those lands to the municipality. Uh, so this is something that the city staff have been certainly eager to, to move forward on for a number of years now. Um, uh, it will allow us for any redevelopment of those areas. Principally, these areas are in the, the lakeside area uh, that minimize any uh, legal risk as well as uh, any operational challenges oftentimes, especially when you look at any funding implications to which you may not have clear title to the land. It, it does come into uh, to play. So uh, this is, um, and, and I think based on the, the price of the land as well, uh, to which two dollars per parcel as well as any uh, ending cost with the crown uh, is evidence of the the fact that these lands should have been invested to the municipality um, many years ago uh, and this uh, this will uh, will support um, you know any future projects and in, in moving forward and, and, uh, and i'm happy to take any questions related to it um, I was just really surprised to see all those small par parcels mm -hmm. there because this is the first time I've ever heard that that company, I don't know how long they've been gone for, and why would they have had all, all those parcels accumulated all over, you know, that area? Yeah. Just, just little parcels. Yeah, and it's a bit of an exercise we were engaging some legal counsel on and, and trying to you know, understand a bit of the history as well as to have a full scope of those lands, but fortunately, 
when they went to the crown, that kind of fell into our lap that we were able to, to move forward on it. So I'm unclear on the, uh, the historical nature of how that happened or why that you know, land wasn't transferred to the city. I know this is not, I think, unique to the, to the lakeside area into which there's lands which we have uh, assets over. And, and uh, it's an ongoing, I think, challenge or um, project for staff is, is cleaning up those lands as the opportunities uh, kind of present themselves. And um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's um, uh, definitely a big task for us. Thanks. Yeah, I Thanks, think Adam. you'll find a majority of those lands are, are the are the right of ways mm -hmm. within Lakeside. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, less the small piece, I guess, at, at the uh, next to the former well, laundromat and the blue heron there. But uh, I, I do believe uh, the Western Lumber Company was, uh, I, I guess, a stud mill operation that that had operations close to the rec center or thereabouts. So they probably owned a large tract of land probably obtained from the Hudson Bay Company. And over time, uh, I guess, created certain subdivisions in Lakeside. And as those earlier subdivisions came on stream, uh, the right-of-ways, I guess, were never dedicated by the Western Lumber Company and never accepted by the former Rat Portage or whatever in a formal process to put it into the city's name under a right-of-way. So I think these are just kind of old hanging right-of-ways that were never taken care of properly right from day one when the Western Lumber Company or whoever they sold to to make the subdivisions you know, transferred these right-of-ways. Some of the smaller, narrower pieces are, are actual lane allowances that you see on those drawings. Um, but again, I think uh, it does clean up quite a bit of, of confusion in the lakeside area and I guess the precipitating factor of this was actually Enbridge Gas Company wanting to do some gas work in Lakeside mm. and asking us for permission to to extend their mains and do whatever work they needed to and them doing some research into this area going eh, the city doesn't own these how why are you giving us permission to go ahead with this work well it's kind of a long long standing fact I guess of several decades or maybe a hundred years or so that, that this is precipitated and finally come to a conclusion because um, I guess without Enbridge pushing the issue to, through the government, the provincial government, uh, and with it being, a, I guess, a defunct corporation, made it a lot easier to obtain these as opposed to uh, a singular person owning these who maybe created the subdivision as long past, where you have to jump through a bunch of hoops to, to you know, advertise in certain gazette, you know, publications and whatnot to say is there any heirs, successors, you know, family members of, of the previous owner that may have interest in these lands. <laughs> so anyway, it's it's a big boom to the city to, to obtain these lands as quick and as as economically as we see here, just having to pay the two dollar fee and, and cover some, some legal fees. So nice to get it cleaned up. Oh, for sure. Interesting piece of history. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Councillor McMillan, did you have no, a question? No, I'm good. Oh, I, thought, I thought you were, because I, you were a young man at that time, you would have I was going to tell you about one of the stud mills, I think, was uh, by the rec centre on the creek, but that was before my time. And there was one in Lakeside, which was before my time. Yeah, as I understand, there was several associated businesses, yeah. and one of the bigger ones was Window and Sash Company. Yeah. But I do remember the 1950 flood. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, anything further on that one? Uh, next to our amendment to the Municipal Capital Facilities Bylaw. Let's see again, Adam. Yep, so the, uh, the intent um, for this report here is to um, uh, just further support uh, afford affordable housing projects in the community. Uh, with the, the bylaw being in effect for, for about three years now, we've I think we've noted some of the constraints in the existing bylaw uh, in which uh, generally for projects in Kenora based on the, the, the cost to move ahead uh, to meet our definition for affordable housing and have all units contain those affordable units uh, it's somewhat impractical um, so with the the change to the bylaw it does enable the city to participate in projects in which there's a mix so you could have a mix of market and, and affordable units um, and then it is to the city council's discretion in which the nature of the support that could be provided. Um, so the bylaw sets basically the, the policy framework for in which the city would be able to enter into a municipal capital facilities agreement uh, with a proponent. Um, and through this agreement, 
uh, that nature of the support would be further formalized and any terms and conditions tied to it would be developed as well. So uh, our hope is that this uh, you know, creates more of a, a carrot um, to, uh, to moving ahead on some of these affordable uh, housing projects um, and, uh, uh, and has an impact and, and addresses some of our, our strategic priorities. Gotcha. Gotcha for you. Uh, Adam, j just so I have this straight in my mind, um, so when we've entered into agreements with the Kenora District Service Board, uh, you know, either a swap or a purchase mm -hmm. plan on their behalf, and then we've done some, uh, we've provided funding uh, to be reimbursed to the proponent at a time when it's completed, like mm -hmm. for infrastructure. So what is this more on the private sector? Like what is this like a, addresses a uh, private sector, not a, a government department or a government funded department? Uh, is this the difference, the only difference? Yeah, for sure. And, and I think um, right now in terms of the KDSB being a public agency, the, there, there isn't a, kind of a, a legal requirement to have such agreement to, to avoid any kind of um, challenges with bonusing. Okay. Um, so what this agreement does, it, it allows you to, to, to work around those uh, bonusing regs in the municipal act. Um, it allows you to, to participate for not only just the private sector, but also for nonprofit uh, entities as well. Councillor Smith. Yeah, those are good questions, uh, uh, Councillor Pori, and thanks, because I was kind of wondering about that. I was trying to get my head around what this really, really means uh, in relation to the KDSB. So that goes back to conversations around inclusive housing where we're trying to incentivize developers to, um, along with building market rent, if they put those some of those affordable units into their builds, they will ha get some kind of rebate on infrastructure costs or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, so it's, um, uh, exactly. It's more of a, I think, uh, you know, you the analogy being the carrot post of the stick, right? And I think there was a previous deputation that spoke to mm -hmm. uh, inclusionary zoning as a means to um, to create affordable housing within these, some of these more market-based developments. But I think this bylaw and, and the change to it uh, is really more the carrot approach to doing mm -hmm. so. And I think my hope is that uh, is a little bit more, uh, maybe lo less of a coercive means to, to, to get those units going. And, and I will say even for there are various projects in which the city, uh, when we think of uh, public works, uh, for example, oftentimes, you know, when we're doing a, a say a municipal roadway or putting water sewer in, there's some there's complementary co-benefits to say the existing neighborhood. So that allows us still to as staff, you know, we have some reasonable certainty we can still do that and not have to have an agreement in place. But with the bylaw, it allows us to have complete flexibility in what the na and nature of the support may be. So this well, this is perfect. Yeah. It's a, a really good way to incentivize the private sector to to meet a need in our communities. And I go back to my years many, many years ago when I was on the um, Town of Kuwaitan Planning Committee, there was a provincial grant for developers that when they were building uh, market housing, if they included a quarter of their project as um, affordable housing, then they got grants for that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is, this is a really good step. Thanks. Anything else on this? Okay. Adam, moving on, uh, building officials appointment bylaw. Okay. Uh, so currently, the uh, the city of Kenora does have uh, two building officials, being a CBO and a deputy chief building official. Uh, but be given the criticality of the the service area, uh, this what we're proposing here is to appoint a number of individuals from RSM Building Consultants as a more of a contingency plan in the event that there is. Um, say unforeseen absences or in the event that uh, and similar to what we do for other service areas where maybe a, a third party review is needs to be triggered uh, unlike other service areas so I use planning as an example uh, there's no legal requirement to have say a, an appointment to a, a planner to in order to do uh, various reports or so forth or to make recommendations uh, however under the Ontario Building Code Act uh, uh, the municipality does have to have such uh, officials appointed and they must in order to carry out the work uh, to be fully qualified in those areas. So uh, recognizing that the, um, I'd say the, those technical requirements that uh, I would like to, to have this um, appointment bylaw go forward to allow us to, to use that, uh, uh, the, these consultants uh, when more on an as needed basis and uh, also just to avoid any, um, any challenges we have into the future if there are uh, gaps in service that we, 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 do, uh, we do have. Questions? Yeah. Councillor Ben Rowan. 
Is uh, is there any layoffs going to be involved in this, a deputy building inspector or not? No. Uh, there is no layoffs uh, or no staffing implications with this uh, whatsoever. It's simply about uh, uh, providing some or having the, um, uh, some additional support uh, for the department to have any more background. Um, obviously, just noted in the budget uh, that I didn't uh, uh, give any costs because at this point in time, the first step is simply having them appointed. I wouldn't want, say, in the event that we needed to use them to wait for next council meeting to have that appointment bylaw go forward before we could actually have them do any plans review. Uh, inspections or any other s enforcement um, because in the absence of having an official who has the, the qualifications or being appointed uh, you can't carry out those activities Thanks. Anything further? No. our next committee of the home meeting is Tuesday July 12th 2022 uh, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, Council, uh, any comments? Uh, we'll start with Councillor Mullinan. No, I have nothing at this time. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Um, I just want to ask Adam, is this your last uh, council meeting? This is for sure my last one. <laughs> 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 I didn't know that last time was awkward, but. Quit smiling. Yeah, it's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's hiding the pain under my eyes. So I just want to say that um, um, uh, good luck in your new job and in your community. Um, I do hope to see you back. It's been a pleasure working with you, and you will be missed. Appreciate thanks, that. Adam. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor McMillan. Oh, I'm good, thanks. Councillor Chase. Uh, I have nothing to do at this time, thank you. Councillor Poirier. Uh, thanks, uh, Acting Deputy Mayor. Is that okay? <laughs> or call me with Mayor you. Goss, okay, <laughs> whatever you call me that one. Um, so I just want to acknowledge. Um, uh, we had a provincial election last week, and I just want to acknowledge all the candidates that ran, because as we know, it's not always easy. Uh, you give up a lot of time. Uh, win or lose, it doesn't matter, and that uh, people putting their name forward, I think, is very important. Uh, but I also want to uh, recognize and congratulate our newly elected, or re-elected uh, MPP, and uh, look forward to the continued work with uh, him. He, uh, he's been a tremendous asset, uh, putting party politics aside, uh, you know, proof in the pudding in this, uh, in this agenda today where we have, uh, we have all kinds of grant money and, and such that uh, we wouldn't have had and we have projects on the go that we wouldn't have had on the go. So uh, congratulate him. Hopefully as a council we continue to work forward with this individual. Uh, in his role as MPP and hopefully as a cabinet minister or not. So uh, kudos to Greg Rickford and again a big shout out to all the other, I believe it was seven other candidates that uh, ran the provincial election. Um, job well done. Mm -hmm. so. And I would just like to mention that uh, June 21st is National Indigenous Peoples mm -hmm. Day. Uh, it looks like our Chief's advisory has uh, pulled together a pretty major event out of the former Striker Farm. Uh, beginning at 10 o'clock, uh, there were invitations to, uh, to the general public. I would suggest that the council can get out there at 10 and be back here for the noon meeting. It would be well worth it. They have a whole slew of uh, dignitaries, a lot planned for the day. Uh, it looks like a, a very major project on their part, and uh, let's all bear in mind that uh, this is a good way to show that we're all treaty people to go out there and share and see, and I would encourage the general public to go out and see what it is. But those of us who've been out there have been mightily impressed, and I think that uh, as they move forward, we're even going to be further impressed. So uh, once again, 10 o'clock at the Strecker Farm, June 21st. Uh, motion to adjourn to close meeting. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, I move the motion to close, seconded by Councillor Poirier, that pursuant to Section 239, 3.1 of the Municipal Act of 2001, as amended, authorization is hereby given to the committee to move into a closed session at 10.47 a.m. for the purpose of educating and training members pertaining to the CAO update, and further, that this meeting, sorry, that at this meeting, no member will discuss or otherwise deal with any matter in a way that materially advances the business or decision-making of Council.